um, Hamish Martin, I'll, I'll deliver the session today a bit about um, sort of strategic planning and um, forest fire management, how, how we uh, go about that and, and then delve into a bit of the monitoring, evaluation and reporting um, and yeah, how we look to improve the program, what we're doing. Um, now I'll just uh, try and work through this. Uh, you still see my screen there? Yes, mate, all good. Yeah, yeah cool, no worries. Um, so yeah, before we get into the presentation, like Jack, I'd like to acknowledge Victorian traditional owners and their elders past and present as the original custodians, Victoria's lands and waters, and for the Otways landscape, we value our relationships with Eastern Mar Aboriginal Corporation, with Gulajan, Gadabarund and Kirrawarrung country, and Wadarung traditional owner, Aboriginal Corporation as well, who we seek to strengthen in partnership in management and respecting country together. Um, for us, this is also relevant to Greenwich Mirroring traditional owner, Aboriginal Corporation, um, who we work with closely in the west of our region, as you'll see through some of the presentation today. Um, so just along the top of this uh, slide, you'll see um, sort of a bit of a nested representation of where we sit in the organisation. Um, so FM Vic's part of DELP, um, and we partner with Parks Vic, Vic Forest, Melbourne Water, and our core purpose is protecting people, property and the environment. Um, Mel and myself sit in the risk and evaluation team, which is part of the regional forest and fire planning team. And we've got a key focus on strategic bushfire management. Um, and just to set the scene, we, we've got some um, key drivers in how and why we do what we do. Um, and firstly, there's the bushfire management code of practice, um, which has the two objectives as, as seen here. Um, one focused on minimising impacts with the prioritisation of human life and the other focused on ecosystem resilience. And you'll see they both have environmental aspects to them. Um, but I guess overlaying this, there's a raft of other elements directing what we do and how we go about it. Um, a number of them identified here. And I guess this means we need to be quite adaptive and constantly evolving in how we meet um, the expectations that come with it. Um, and importantly, including things like um, living up to the community charter and putting community at the centre of everything we do um, and delivering on our commitment um, to Aboriginal self-determination and supporting healing country. Um, and one way we can, uh, that can help us succeed in this is um, using our partnerships and, and leveraging off, off the knowledge that comes with that. Um, and those groups to the right, uh, on the right of the slide, so in conjunction with traditional owner partners and local knowledge holders are some examples of how we, we build knowledge and look to improve our program. And you'll hear from some of these throughout the day um, with their direct involvement in this and in the session last week. Um, so I guess to, to make this work, we need strong but adaptable frameworks um, so we can enable continual improvement. Um, and as a part of this, we have uh, three levels of, of planning. Firstly, our strategic planning, which gives us our long-term vision and, and which I'll concentrate on today. Um, our operational planning, which is your sort of medium term intent for what we intend to do over the next few years. And, and tactical planning about how we're delivering the individual activities like, like burns or, or mechanical treatments. Um, and as illustrated here, MER, uh, as well as community engagement, and knowledge and information sharing really supports the feedback loop to improve um, future management decisions. Um, so now I'll, I'll briefly step through the SPRAS process, which was um, a, a process designed to um, go through strategic, uh, developing strategic plan um, and some of the MER we've been delivering to support this. And you'll also hear from Julian at Uni Melbourne about some of the work they've been delivering um, for us to better use the data we've, we've got available. Um, so the intent of the SBRAS process, which a number of you have probably heard of before, was to produce the long-term vision for how fuel management would be delivered. Um, and the time horizon for this was, was four years. Um, it was developed over a two year period um, between 2013 and 2015 um, using a structured decision making process, um, which you can see uh, the steps of on the slide there and um, really looking to embrace community and agency collaboration in, in the development of the strategy. Um, and so this sort of leads to the first part of it, um, 
how do we manage fire in the landscape? And generally, like fire is complex, it, it can be divisive um, and has enormous impacts. And I guess we've become very good at fire suppression, keeping fires small, but but this has resulted in in structural change to the landscape and it's altered the risk profile. So finding the right balance of how and where and when we apply fire is inherently complex. So to guide the process, um, fundamental, fundamental objectives were developed um, for the key things we value as a community and metrics derived about how we measure this and make it meaningful. Um, so for example, what the cost of various proposed strategies be in terms of the cost of industry or cost of the environment or human life loss, um, those sort of things. And um, I guess just noting fuel management isn't the only lever that we can use to impact this or the only one that was considered in the process, but, but is a key one. And I guess pulling too hard in either direction, um, more burning or less burning, or um, that, that can have impacts on these values. So looking a bit closer at how the environment is considered in particular, um, I guess natural environment can be measured in multiple ways. And um, as the intent of the process was to take options to community and agency representatives to make some trade-off decisions, making it meaningful required it to be made tangible. And as formal response was generally the best understood, um, the metric of proportional change in formal species abundance over a 40 year period was the trade-off metric that was applied um, for the process. Um, later, this was also put through an optimization process um, using other key metrics like GMA and TFI, et cetera, to enable tweaking of the strategies to leverage some additional benefits. So next, a number of alternative scenarios were developed, um, including a range of treatments, things like the amounts of burning and suppression or um, modifying ignitions, like increasing patrols or burying power lines, um, the exposures and vulnerability of assets. So things like building standards and um, including fuel breaks around communities, those sort of things. Um, and the consequences of the strategies can then be modeled and can be reviewed in a trade-off sense where either support or opposition for a proposed strategy can be gauged. And as you can see from the graph on the right there, um, three key strategies attracted significant support with the loft position and, and they were the building blocks for the final strategy selected um, with, with some follow-up optimization. So again, looking a bit closer at the environmental factors. Um, as an example, the swamp antichinus has a modelled species habitat. And we also have an impression of its preferences for different growth stages um, as a link to time since fire. And just to note, this is uh, expert opinion data informing this, which is sort of the best data we have available at, at the time to, to inform it. And then using a complex fire modelling approach, um, which includes thousands of different fire starts and hundreds of different weather scenarios, um, growth stage outcomes can be developed um, on the different strategies. And this then enables a calculation of impacts um, on the species in terms of a mean change in abundance. So, so then we come to implementation where operational and tactical planning align to the intent of the strategy and over time, we can continue to review the actual implementation um, uh, compared to the strategy and determine how metrics are tracking in relation to the objectives. So key to note that these are all model figures and RME are programs building the capacity to use empirical data or, or validation of the model outputs to determine if the strategy is performing as expected or, or needs refinement. Thanks. Mm. So just a bit of an overview there, like ESPRAS was developed over a couple of years between 2013 and 2015 and refreshed in 2020 as part of a statewide strategic bushfire management planning process. And, and now we have the opportunity to use uh, MER to improve the foundations of the planning. Okay, so now, now you know a bit about the strategy and a bit about um, who, who we are and what we're doing. I'll take you through some of the projects we've been delivering to progress filling some of our knowledge gaps and understanding if it's on track. And um, as a quick summary of what's been guiding the MER program over recent years, 
uh, I guess we've had a key focus on data, um, making sure we have the right data, that it's in a format we can use to inform our decision making. And this has come as we've had a bit of a history of collecting lots of data, but it not being in a form that's really um, useful for us in, in, in a good structure. I've also had a key focus on partnering with traditional owners, so trying to achieve some mutually benefit outcomes. Um, working with our, our district staff to understand the high priority risks and they know their patch and what's needed moving forward. So really engaging closely with them. Um, gaining a better understanding of forest health indicators and landscape scale refuge and being able to track this over time using remote sensing and collecting information on fuel hazard to inform our burn planning and delivery and improving our fuel accumulation data. So those are some of the key things we focus on. Um, and we were uh, fortunate to receive a reasonable amount of funding through the Reducing Bushfire Risk Program um, in the last financial year. And we're able to deliver on a um, number of key projects. And there's a few here that I'll focus on just running through quickly. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, uh, we use modeling to predict fire spread and use Phoenix for that. And that underpins the strategy. So. Um, any improvements to this will provide for improved accuracy of the strategy, both from a residual risk and ecological perspective. Um, and as a brief, brief background, fire prediction models use fuel accumulation curves to determine how forest fuels develop over time once they've been burnt. Um, these curves use uh, data derived through expert elicitation. And though this is the best we have to work with, we know, we know there's inaccuracies in this and they can be improved. Um, and it can result in underestimation or overestimation of effectiveness of fuel treatments. So we're looking to use empirical data to refine them. Um, and to progress this, we've engaged the Uni of Melbourne to develop a more robust methodology um, and uh, be able to yeah, collect accurate data. We've got 130 sites we're looking at in fuel type five as a first trial for that, uh, which is the woodland heath. Um, and we've also purchased a couple of terrestrial LIDAR um, laser scanners to um, further test improvements to the methods, um, following on some research by a colleague of ours, Sam Hillman. Um, and here's an example of a point cloud that um, the terrestrial laser scanner can produce. And, and as you can see, in the right setting, it can give a really detailed measure of the fuel structure. Um, and I guess some outstanding things for this project, we'll continue our data collection in that fuel type, maybe expand to other fuel types. Um, we yeah. still need to do all the data analysis for it. And, and we might look at other ways we can use it in things like habitat structure monitoring um, as well. Uh, another key project we've had, um, which is a long running one, is the uh, creation of a database to house all our ecological data. So this now has a pretty impressive amount of data from amongst the Bowen Southwest and Grampian region footprints and is now cleaned and ready for use and analysis. Um, still data we'd like to get in there, but, but we've got a lot of key data in there that we can, we can use now. Um, and the key to this is that it will directly inform our management. And um, as mentioned, we've engaged uh, Uni of Melbourne with Julian and uh, Holly Sitters to build a tool we can use to um, have some direct outputs in that. Um, and I won't steal Julian Sunday, he'll talk about that, that next. Um, and yeah, so moving forward, uh, I guess how we collect the data um, to then feed into knowledge gaps there. Um, for, for the last couple of years, we've been partnering with Wadarung um, in training their natural resource management crews in methods that inform species response to habitat change. And uh, I guess a key driver of this is to collect ecological data of use to us, but it'll also provide an opportunity to evolve the data we're collecting and, and recognising the data is very FFMV focused. We, we can adapt this over time to build knowledge in areas of greater relevance to, to each group. Um, and this partnership also provides opportunities to be part of the fire program from the start, accessing country, observing current e ecology and potentially being part of the burning and seeing how it changes over time. So we hope it will not only provide valuable data for our modelling, but also provide first-hand knowledge of fire and its effects on country. And 
with the move to increase mosaic winter burning in the Anglesey Heath, that, that was the key factor in determining where in the landscape we do this monitoring. And as we're starting some similar burning in Kembrook Heath in the west of our region, this was a logical starting point to engage with Gunditch Muring, um, who, who are also interested in the program and have started some sort of training in the methods we're using. Um, as part of this, we've also acquired some toolkits and um, developed some applications to be able to collect the data and have it all cloud-based and readily accessible so that we, we can immediately input into our um, biodiversity monitoring database. So, so moving forward, we'd look to continue building skills um, in the areas uh, and also engage with Eastern Ma um, if, if they've got an interest in that and as we're moving into burning in um, sort of heathland ecosystems in, in that country, um, work out where and what in the landscape is of interest to these groups and how we can monitor to be of relevant ref, ref, relevance to everyone. Um, and we'll do targeted monitoring informed by the knowledge gaps identified through our database. Um, so at a, at a broader level, we also collect landscape scale data um, to look at the impact and effectiveness of the strategy. Um, and a real exciting one for us has been investigating forest health um, uh, through use of NDVI technology. Um, this has been delivered by Mark Gakarklis and Barb Wilson and um, has been completed in the far southwest with a focus on the southeastern red tailed black copper two habitat. Um, we, like I said, we use NDVI data paired with field validation. Um, this is an expansion of a couple of projects we used to map out the severity and extent of woody weeds through the area. Um, and as you can see uh, through the uh, pictures on the slide, it can be visualised in things like a dashboard, uh, the whole landscape or reserve scale, and control charts that provide insight into when NDVI has changed over time to inform the degree of change and cause. Um, so this will provide a great both basis for ongoing, ongoing broad scale monitoring of the area and inform sort of direct practical land management. Um, and this has evolved into the next project, um, identifying areas of refuge through the landscape. Now this one's definitely Mel's baby and it's also been delivered by Barb Wilson and Mark Garkarklis who are online today. So I won't do too much detail, otherwise I'll probably misrepresent it too much, but, and Mark and Barb, uh, heckle in the chat if you need to, but this is also um, an extension of another project that was underway in the Otways using topographical position index and NDVI with field validation to, de to determine likely areas of refuge for small mammals during landscape scale disturbance events. So these can be integrated into our planning. Um, so similarly in the far southwest, but focus more on NDVI. Um, it aims to give us a better understanding of where biodiversity retreats to and where we need to focus protection efforts. Um, there's ongoing data collection and analysis underway in this project before reporting. Um, and we'll look to ways to develop, to monitor this over time, to keep the knowledge current and usable. Uh, and, and finally, Generally, we've been collecting a lot of fuel hazard data. So this not only gives us some measured data pre and post treatment, but also provides a great opportunity for our crews to be getting out familiar with the burning areas and focus on with a focus on fuel hazard and structure and arrangement of those fuels. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the um, Conservation Ecology Centre. They collected a massive amount of data over a short period um, for a project um, that Tamika Farley presented last week. Um, and the fuel hazard data, this is available to our burn planners, um, plan burn operations officers and burn OIT and, and all our crews through a web map so they can see the raw data and the images we've collected at each site. Um, and yeah, just some acknowledgements of the program. We've had a heap of people contributing to a big MER program this year. I won't go through them all, but here's some of them. So thanks everyone there for your, your support. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to present, Jack. No worries at all, Hamish. Thanks for thanks for the presentation. Really comprehensive, mate. <clears throat> there is a, a question for you if uh, if you're up for it. Uh, what so, does NDVI stand for? Oh, um, I, I'll butcher this too. Normalised uh, differential vegetation index. I think it's basically the health of the vegetation beautiful beautiful answer um 
they're the questions that I had in the chat, mate. So um, thanks very much for your presentation and um, we'll, uh, we'll move to the next presenter. Thanks, Hamish.